All right, so let's think about the basics that we know from plants. We know plants need CO2, not oxygen, in order to do their thing, and we know that they need light. Now, the way that this light is going to be absorbed is going to be through the pigments. The main pigment that we're going to be talking about is chlorophyll. So, before we even get to the actual sunlight, when we look at light, we may not see it as such, but light comes in different types of wavelengths, those wavelengths basically representing a specific color. For the sake of plants, if you look at a plant right now, or like a lima bean or something, you'll notice that the plant, or the leaf, or whatever, is green. Now, technically speaking, the, the leaf itself is not actually green, because it, it absorbs all these colors. The only reason you see it as green is because it will not absorb the green color. So, that being said, with the two chlorophylls, you'll notice here in this chart that they will absorb all these colors, but again, not green. Now eventually what will happen is the chlorophyll will start to break down. Once the chlorophyll actually breaks down, it will start to become orangey and like reddish, which is what you will see any place that's not Florida when you see fall. Now the reason the leaf is so important, the leaf is where your, the plant is going to get all the energy that it needs in order to properly create its own food. So remember, plants do not grow legs and go around hunting. They have to actually sit there take what they have, and make the food that they need. Now when we're looking at the actual chloroplast, you're going to have the little membranes, which are fine. Now these stacks right here, they kind of look like coin stacks, I, they're going to go through a process that is going to help the plant make the energy it needs, but it's only part of the process. Now in order to help you guys memorize what process is what, these are the little pancake things, or coin things we were talking about. Each specific pancake is called a thylakoid. The stack of pancakes is called a granum. Now for the sake of this comparison, the syrup or anything surrounding the pancake stack is going to be the stroma. Now the leaf is, or the, the leaf, the chloroplast is divided into two sections. You're going to have light dependent reaction. The reason it's called light dependent is because it's going to take the excitement the excited electrons from the actual light energy, which we will go over in more detail later on, and it's going to create the energy needs for the second part of this process. Now, it's the second part is light independent reactions because it itself doesn't really need that light energy or those excited electrons to come in. They're going to be transferred with NADPH. Um, you'll notice a lot of words here. For now, don't worry too much about it. I'll get into de detail about it in a second. I do want you to note that ATP, or adenine triphosphate, is a form of energy. It is the top-notch energy. It is a full battery on a cell phone kind of energy. ADP is more like 50%. Um, it's missing a phosphate group. There's also AMP, but we won't be really talking about it much now. It's basically you're at 20%. Your phone may or may not die. It's not a great charge. Okay, so when the electrons get all excited and stuff, you're going to end up with two electrons that you're going to need to pass around. The things that are going to pass the electrons around are going to be called electron carriers. Now, the best way to show you guys is if I'm trying to move a potato, the potato will not grow legs and move on. It's going to need help. In this case, NADP+, which is the actual electron carrier, is going to grab a hydrogen, which in this case, let's call it the oven mitt. It's going to grab the potato, and then you're going to move it to where it needs to be, which in this case is going to be towards the light independent reaction. This is photosynthesis simplified for you guys. You're going to end up absorbing CO2 and water and then you're going to end up with sugars and oxygen as a result. In the sugar that we're going to be actually talking about is glucose. Basically, it's going to be broken down, and you're going to be able to use that as extra energy. We already went through this. So you have the electrons here. NADP plus with a hydrogen will come in, grab it. So you'll end up with NADPH. It's going to transfer it out, and then it's going to go through its own little cycle in the light-independent reaction. This is all happening in the chloroplast, in a plant cell, in the leaf. 
So, in the thylakoids, you have chlorophyll and proteins that are called photosystems. Now, here's where it gets really confusing. When you're looking at the photosystems, you have photosystem 2 first, then photosystem 1. Now, the reason it is such an actual mess is because photosystem 1 was discovered first, then we realized photosystem 2, which went ahead of it, was a thing. So, please remember when we're talking about the light-dependent reactions, when we're going through the, the proteins in the thylakoids, photosystem 2 goes first, then photosystem 1. Basically, the high energy electrons are going to pass through this thing called an electron transport chain where they're basically going to be shoved from one area to another that, and that process itself will create the ATP that you need in order to keep going and get the food that you need as a plant. So you're going to need water in order to get this thing moving first of all. So you're going to get two water, electro, uh, two water molecules. They're going to be broken down. You're going to have H2O. So one oxygen and four hydrogens. Remember the hydrogens are then going to be attached to NADP+, which are going to help the electrons be moved around. Also the breaking down of this whole process is going to release two electrons, which are the ones that we were talking about before. Um, in the middle, between photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, you do have a pump. It's going to pump hydrogens towards one section. Usually you want everything to be leveled out, but if I'm shoving a lot of hydrogens over from one side to the other, my concentration is going to be higher on the inside. And that's what you need in order to get these electrons moving from side to side. Now in order to break down the water molecule, that which I kind of skimmed over at the beginning, let me go back. The water molecule broke because of the energy provided from the sunlight, and that's what got this whole thing going. And the electrons are going to be passed on again because of the pump and the conditions created by the pump, and move on to photosystem 1. Once that whole process is done, photosystem 1 is basically going to, I was going to say spit out, but that's not the proper word, you're going to end up with two NADPH, which again is going to have those electrons. And if you have two, that means you're, you're escorting four of them over. Okay, so you have ATP synthase at the very end, which is, again, going to get all those excess hydrogen here, and it's going to spew it out. I'm going to move on from that. Okay, so now we're going to go to the light-independent reactions. We already went over where it is. The actual process that you're going to see, the cycle itself, is called the Calvin cycle. There's a very similar example that you're going to see when we go over cellular respiration. Now, the reason we were going to want to cover these two very closely together is because cellular respiration and photosynthesis are the same process, reversed. Instead of having sunlight, though, you're going to have actual chemical energy in cellular respiration. So let's go through this. You're going to have six CO2s coming in. Let me see if I can get the whole cycle. All right, there we go. All right, so six CO2 come in. There's already six CO2 here, which means you're going to have a total of 12 carbons over here. They're going to end up having energy and electron carriers that are going to come in and out of the cycle. Um, as you see, ATP comes in, it's going to give a phosphate group, so it's going to be a little less charged than it was. It's going to go back to the first system where it's going to go from ADP to ATP, which is what you guys saw in the, in the overview that we just gave. Then the ADP, a, NADPH is going to get rid of the electrons, now it's going to go back to NADP+, plus, and it's going to start breaking things apart. Remember, you end up with sugars, here are the sugars. The sugars are going to exit the cycle. Then eventually it's going to again convert to, it's going to pick up the phosphate group it, it gave up on the other side. It's going to go off as ATP and then we're going to go through the cycle again. You're going to end up with six carbons, which is again what we started off with here. It's going to keep going and going so there will always be six that are going to attest to the six that are being introduced at the same part. We are not going to make you guys memorize that because that is insane, but just keep in mind it is an ongoing process that feeds onto itself. 
And remember, all of these are going to go back to the first part, and they're going to come back to the second part. And it's just going to go back over and over and over and over again. So your end results, you're going to end up with oxygens, which again is why the plants give off the oxygens, and sugar, which is how the plant is going to eat. Things that can affect the plant. So you guys did a plant-related experiment in lab earlier where you got to affect a lot of what was going on. The temperature, if it's not at a certain temperature, some plants get finicky. If it's too hot, maybe they won't open their stomatas up as much, which means they won't go through photosynthesis as much as if it was the right kind of temperature. Remember, plants have certain specifications that allow them to optimize the amount of energy that they're creating while releasing a little less water. So that's one of them. A lot of plants need shade, some don't. Think of a difference, the difference between like an orchid versus a cactus. They're not going to want the same kind of shade, they won't want the same kind of water. They each have their own specific areas. Uh, you also have water loss because of any kind of damage. So if you went up to a plant and you stabbed it for whatever reason with something small, like a pen, you, it's going to be leaking water from there, so maybe it's, again, it's not going to want to open that stomata in order to lose more water, even though it means more food. Uh, also, the amount of water available, if there's a shortage, they won't open it as much. It depends on the conditions that they're living in. It's all about finding the right balance. 